Okay. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jonathan Wurtzen, and I'm a member of the Council on Middle East Studies here at Yale University. Um, and it is my pleasure to be able to uh, get us started to welcome you back for the spring um, series of talks that we're sponsoring here at CMES. And uh, really, the, the really great pleasure and privilege to be able to introduce our talk today uh, by Professor Nizar Massari. Uh, Professor Massari is uh, visiting this year here at Yale as a Rice Fellow at uh, the Macmillan Center in the Council on Middle East Studies. He's an Associate Professor of International Relations at El Ahawain University and a friend Morocco with whom we enjoy a really warm uh, uh, kind of partnership um, and, and uh, collaboration. And uh, Professor Massari is, uh, has taught at Ahawain and served in various roles, including as the Vice President for Academic Affairs there, uh, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and Humanities. Um, and in terms of his research, um, having taught there in Morocco, uh, in the United States, and uh, also for, for a long period in the Rio de Janeiro, the Pontifical Catholic University, um, has focused on international relations from the perspective of the global south uh, and a kind of comparative uh, approach uh, on that and, and critical IR studies. And today uh, it's really um, wonderful to be able to hear about the work that he's currently doing um, in, uh, in, 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 this, in these areas and specifically in, with relation to security in the Middle East and North Africa. So it is uh, really such a great pleasure to welcome you, uh, Nizar, and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jonathan Wilson. It's a great pleasure to be here to, today with all of you. Um, before I start, I want to express my gratitude to uh, the Macmillan Center at Yale University and to the Council on Middle East Studies with uh, Dr. Inhorn and Dr. Uh, Wilson for their invitation to be here this year with you. It has been a pleasure to um, attend so many fascinating lectures and to meet uh, many of you and to exchange with you uh, on your research and on mine <clears throat> and uh, to be with your students. So uh, it has been an excellent opportunity for me and I, am, uh, I want to express my gratitude here uh, for that opportunity. Um, I also, so as uh, Dr. Winston said, uh, I have been uh, away from real academia for many years, and this is a great opportunity for me to go back to a ac real academic work and um, do some uh, catch up reading in the field of international relations and international security and uh, try to bring my own contribution. So this is what I will be presenting to you uh, today is um, a work in progress and I will start sharing my screen. So uh, this is pretty much work in progress. Uh, but, uh, 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 and I would be uh, clearly uh, very happy to uh, hear from you and your feedback and um, suggestions as you will see throughout my presentation. There are a few places where I am asking questions and uh, these questions, uh, I hope I will get, uh, I will be discussing them with you in order to, uh, uh, um, to be able to make some progress. So I'm trying to move to the next screen. And so maybe I need to share another document on here. Okay, so. Okay, so this is working better. Um, so, um, uh, 
as Dr. Ridden said uh, in his introduction, um, my objective here is to be uh, exploring uh, what would be the contribution uh, of someone who deals with IR, teaches IR, uh, studies IR uh, in uh, other parts, from other parts in the world. I uh, worked in Brazil, I'm working right now in Morocco. So when we deal with IR and we deal with we see the literature that exists uh, out there uh, that has that existed for many years out there we see that it, the literature can be fascinating but it doesn't deal with our issues or it doesn't help us make sense of our own uh, issues so here uh, i will be referring to ir and uh, there is a great scholar uh, robert cox uh, who once wrote uh, that uh, uh, theories are written by someone for the benefit of someone uh, so this means that theories are absolutely not neutral they are not value free uh, and um, this is what made Cox distinguish between two kinds of theories, uh, uh, status quo theories versus uh, uh, eman uh, 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 emancipatory theories. So the status quo theories uh, seek to solve problems uh, 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 for those who are already uh, holding power and the emancipatory theories, uh, he called them critical theories. They help those who are not in power in order to uh, 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 change things. So um, uh, uh, this uh, work by, uh, by uh, Cox um, is very influential in the field of international relations. And what it means is that, uh, uh, and I, I completely agree that this is what I just said is not new, but also it is not consensual, uh, but it represents nevertheless my first basic assumption in the work I will be presenting to you today, that knowledge is socially constructed, that it's not something that is given to us, that uh, it is uh, socially constructed, we construct it. My second assumption, and again, as I was saying with the first assumption, again, this is not uh, uh, new, but also this is not consensual. Reality, whatever we can call reality, the world out there, uh, the world in which we live is also socially constructed. So these are my two basic assumptions and it is from based on these two assumptions that I deal with, uh, uh, with what I will be presenting to you today. Um, so let me go back to my first assumption, uh, the social construction of knowledge. Um, this uh, uh, assumption has been, uh, has had a very uh, important impact in the field of international security since the late 1980s. Uh, so we've had uh, new contributions uh, from constructivism starting in 1989, critical theory in the mid 80s, gender studies a little bit even before that, postmodern and post scholars, uh, post uh, structural scholars started bringing their contributions, uh, post colonial scholars too. So it opened the, the, the facts that to admit that knowledge is socially constructed, open the field of international relations to uh, these, this proliferation of contributions. <laughs> What, uh, in my own background, and when I was in Brazil for so many years, in Latin America, many were criticizing precisely the field of IR and saying, this field doesn't help us make sense of our reality. Um, this field, the way we, we study, or it is studied, and the way we teach it to our students uh, in Latin America makes us just reproduce uh, uh, the balance of power, the existing balance of power, uh, and its concepts and categories do, don't, do not help us change things. So they argued that uh, it was necessary just to get rid 
of all the, 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 the field of IR and build something uh, different that would help Latin America and Latin Americans to solve their own uh, issues and deal with the challenge of uh, um, development with the, the uh, uh, imbalance of power uh, uh, on, on their continent and things like this. So these scholars uh, and some of them are my own professors like Maria Regina Suarez de Lima, uh, uh, Amadou Louis Seville, all of these scholars, scholars with whom I studied IR in the years 2000, they were telling us, well, let's forget about IR. IR is not, uh, is not useful. Uh, uh, to us, it doesn't help us change things. So as you see, there, there was this movement uh, in the field of international relations as a whole. Um, we can't accept uh, to keep just reproducing knowledge. Of, uh, we, we need emancipatory knowledge as Bob Cox was saying. And on the other hand, in a place like Latin America, in Brazil, there was also a contestation of, uh, of what the field of international relations was about and the necessity of having, of studying international politics, don't get me wrong, but studying international politics from uh, a different perspective. So um, as I was saying, these colleagues from Latin America were not isolated. Uh, uh, Mike Shapiro, David Campbell, RBJ Walker, all of them left the field of IR altogether and went to cultural studies, geography, political science. They didn't want to stay in the field of international relations because they found the field hermetically closed uh, to contributions and committed to this continuing reproduction of the existing balance of power uh, and the continuing reproduction of uh, 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 status quo theories. So this is, uh, uh, so this caused a lot of uh, frustration among these scholars of IR. Even those who stayed like Nick Kornhoff, like uh, Jens Bartelson, Didier Bigot, all of them uh, based their work on other scholars than, uh, you know, in the field of IR, we have genealogy. So we say that we, it all started with, uh, with Thucydides. So yes, we go from Thucydides to Machiavelli, to Hobbes. Um, then sometimes some of us stop by um, uh, Max Weber, and then we really start talking about international relations with Hans Morgenstern in 1948. So these scholars, uh, Bigo, uh, Bartelson, and uh, many others, uh, Nick Arnulf, they, they looked for other sources uh, for to study the international, to discuss the international, and to question the international. So um, it's as if we have one field that is going in one direction, and contestation of where that field is going uh, from different points of view. Some left the field altogether and discussed the same topic, but from a different field and others from the field, but uh, with the contestation of what was being done in what we refer to as the mainstream. So, and what was true here for IR uh, uh, is true for international security studies. Um, war studies and uh, classical international security studies uh, are deemed to be the noble field in subfields in IR. And uh, any scholar who wants to be taken seriously should be studying war and, uh, uh, and security. But so uh, in, in, in this field, th this reproduction uh, of, no, uh, of the balance, the existing balance of power, the, 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 the problem solving uh, uh, characteristic of the field of IR exists also in the field of international security studies. So uh, what, what, what was true for IR is also true for uh, security studies. So I personally, always felt that there was space for diversity in the field. The, the field has evolved uh, tremendously over the last uh, 30 years, uh, 30, 40 years, I would say. Um, 
and has been more inclusive to different ontological, epistemological, methodological, geographical, uh, gender. So in the field has been uh, far more diverse uh, since the, the, the mid 80s and early 90s. Um, uh, uh, and we can see that. So th there is no doubt, don't get me wrong again, there is no doubt that the field is still dominated by realists and it is still very much Western centered, uh, but there is space uh, for uh, uh, other contributions. And as much as uh, the, 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 the flagship journal of the International Studies Association, ISQ International Studies Quarterly, is still dealing with uh, uh, publishing ma mainstream work, uh, there are also other journals, IPS, International Political Sociology, for instance, that brings you know, contributions that was precisely established by Rob Walker and Didier Bigot uh, 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 with the idea of uh, allowing these sociological contributions to make, uh, uh, to be present in the field of, in the study of the international. So, um, the field has been more diverse, uh, although it is still uh, dominated by uh, mainstream IR, by realism and some liberal scholars. Um, in the field of international security, I also would say that uh, uh, the, 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 the contestation of uh, the dominance, the Western-centered uh, uh, perspectives uh, has not started yesterday. People like uh, scholars, scholars, not uh, like uh, Mohammed Ayoub and Caroline Thomas uh, have been doing, uh, have been criticizing the field of international security you know, for, uh, and speaking about um, a, a, a third world security predicament as uh, one of the books of Ayoub uh, was, tight, uh, was entitled um, uh, 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 for since the 1970s or the and early 1980s, so um, th there has been a contestation in of the field of secure in the field of security of this uh, rendition of the field of uh, 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 no. There was there has been a, a contestation of the field of secure, uh, international security and how it applies to uh, what used to be called the third world and what we call today the global south and uh, among other things. Um, so I want to return here to my second assumption, the, third, that the fact that the word out there is not given, that it is socially constructed. There are two consequences to this. Um, the first one is that um, as uh, the 1989 book by Nick Onuf, uh, the, the title of the book of Nick Onuf of 1989, uh, 1989, yes, was uh, Word of Our Making. This is a word of our making. Uh, Onuf doesn't totally agree with what I'm going to say, but this is a word of, of, of our way making. It can be done and it can be undone. Change is very hard to, to, to achieve. Change is not easy to achieve, but change is possible. So what, can, what was done one day can be undone. So this is uh, the, 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 the first consequence of the fact that uh, uh, the, the, the word uh, this is the, my second assumption. The, number two, we look at the world through the lenses of uh, uh, social sciences, and we choose what to study, what is relevant, and what is not. We make our selections, uh, and we opt for the, the relevant political, economic, social uh, issues that we will be uh, uh, emphasizing, and we base our decisions on those uh, uh, on those elements. So, uh, I always give the example of uh, the, the key concept of anarchy in international relations. Realists in international relations consider that. Um, Anarchy, or, or some realists, many realists in, in the field, consider that anarchy is defines 
the field of international relations. We cannot understand the field of international relations without the concept of anarchy that is borrowed from uh, Thomas Hobbes. So, these, but when we talk about anarchy, this the assumption there is that this is a word made of states. And this is a word made only of states. Uh, so we end up excluding a whole bunch of other potential agents, and we focus only on relations among states. So not, uh, we don't talk about uh, uh, the NGOs, we don't talk about civil society, we talk only about relations uh, among states. So th this leads me to say that if we want to change the world, we need to change, we need to start first by changing the concepts we, we use in order to refer to the world. The theories we produce in order to conceptualize the world in which we live. We need to change the way we look at the world in order to be able to change the world. So this is the, the second uh, uh, consequence of, of my uh, second assumption, which brings me back to Cox. Since theories are made by someone for the benefit of someone, so some of us might as well opt for emancipatory theories and critical theories, and we can aim at bringing a diverse view to the field and ultimately to make a different world. So this is uh, this is the consequence of uh, of all this discussion. Um, this is what. Uh, uh, some scholars have been doing in, uh, uh, and why I believe that the, the field of IR can still allow us to, uh, to exist in it. Um, this is what colleagues like uh, Arlene Tickner from Colombia, Pinar Bilgin from Turkey, Monica Hurt from Brazil have been doing in the field of IR in general, in international security in particular. Um, and the question then is, what would the study of international security from the perspective of someone who analyzes and teaches IR and international security in North Africa look like? Uh, how significantly different would it be? Is it to study IR when we are where, where I am? And this is why I, I choose that map uh, of Al Idrisi uh, as uh, uh, a visual to accompany the, my presentation today. We look. We need to be looking at the world the same way Al Idrisi looks at the world, and those who see the map and those who looked at that map could see that it is from what we are used to uh, upside down. But this is the perspective. This was that was the perspective of Al Idrisi, and this is the perspective I want to see. So it's not that uh, I want to share with you. So it's not that it's um, it's more relevant or it is more valid or it is more important. No, it is our view on how the world is. That's, uh, and that's my assumption. So to start answering this question, um, I resort to Pinar Bilgin, uh, our colleague from Turkey, from Bilkent University, sorry. Who tells us that the study of the security of the Middle East for a long time was the study of the impact of all the bad things that happen in the Middle East and their impact first on Britain and then now on the US or on Western Europe. So uh, all the bad things that we have and how they impact the security of the other. So it's not our security, it's the security of the UK, uh, the security of the US, the security of the Europeans. So this is what uh, uh, Anne Bilgin proposes, uh, and Tickner also proposes to, um, to study uh, international security from a non-Western perspective. And, to, uh, uh, and this means studying the insecurities, our insecurities so it's a it's a switch in the mode from security to insecurity and from the security of the 
Western Europe to the insecurity of uh, North Africa, the insecurity of the Middle East, uh, the insecurity of South America. Um, so let's uh, let's define what uh, would that refer to. Uh, how is that translated concretely? What does it mean to talk about the security, the, the insecurity of the Middle East? or North Africa or South America or South Asia from the perspective of the Middle East or North Africa or South America or South Asia. Um, I start with the different, uh, with different narratives of agency uh, in North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, there are different uh, uh, narratives and I see that time is flying. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to uh, go a little bit faster in order to allow some time for uh, this, the discussion here. So the, the dominating narrative, uh, and it has been a dominating narrative for 100 plus years, uh, even before the end of the Ottoman Empire, is a borrowed narrative from the Westphalian, Westphalian uh, narrative of the state sovereignty. So uh, there is, uh, we borrowed the concept of the nation state, we brought it there, and uh, it was the message that motivated a lot of uh, uh, leaders uh, to struggle for independence and to, uh, to establish sovereign states uh, 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 sovereign states uh, to replace the, the colonial moment. Um, and in, in this sense, uh, what happens, uh, uh, and this is important to notice, what happens in North Africa is not very much different than what happened in the rest of the world as the literature, uh, wide literature uh, tells us about that uh, from Watson to Spruill to Krasner and others. Um, so, Establishing a, a sovereign state was the, 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 the key argument that, a lot, that motivated people to fight colonialism. Uh, we need to be independent. Um, the, so if initially the insecurity uh, uh, of those uh, uh, colonized was directed against the, the colonizers in order to achieve uh, uh, um, independence. After independence, uh, to that narrative of insecurity changed and uh, from the perspective of the, 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 those uh, states, the, the, the narrative of the other, where the threats come, comes from, was, came to, uh, we had two of them. So one of them was the domestic other, the threat coming from inside, the threat against the regimes coming from inside. And the second one was the, the, the regional other, uh, what Nasser and his narrative of pan-Arabism represented the threat to the, the Saudis. Uh, uh, Saddam Hussein became, started representing that same threat uh, a few years after that, uh, a, few, a couple of decades after that uh, to the Gulf monarchies. Morocco is considered a threat to Algeria. Algeria is considered a threat to Morocco. Um, uh, and Israel was always there. But as Albert Hurani keeps telling us, it, uh, all the regimes were just paying lip service to the Palestinian cause. Uh, they kept saying that Israel was a threat, but uh, they didn't really mean it. And the, 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 it was not their highest priority. And I'll get to uh, later to the contemporary relations with Israel. So, um, uh, so we have that state narrative and the sovereign state narrative and the, the sovereign state narrative centered with these two different others, with these two different sources of threat. Um, there was a, a counter narrative uh, to that one. And uh, it, it's as old, if not older than the state narrative and that the re-establishment of a Muslim Ummah uh, as uh, the previous uh, uh, empires used to exist and to allow Muslims to be ruled by Muslims. Um, colonialism played a key role in promoting this narrative uh, uh, of this Muslim Ummah in order to mobilize Muslims to uh, try to be, to fight, to be uh, 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 
ruled by other Muslims. Uh, uh, and then these, those who promoted this narrative of uh, establishing an ummah, uh, one, they were, they never ruled. Uh, there were voices, dissident voices, as I would, uh, as one might call them. And two, um, they didn't see necessarily uh, the, the creation, the establishment of the independent states as uh, 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 counterproductive. Some of them saw it as a necessary step uh, to reach, uh, to be able to uh, eventually later, later uh, establish an ummah. So, um, so uh, this is important to notice. Um, and as I was saying, although it was, uh, it, it's very popular in what we call the, we call the streets uh, among uh, religious leaders and the population, uh, although, and although it, for some time it was, pop, uh, it was supported by Saudi Arabia, which saw in it uh, uh, a way to counter the, the uh, Nasser's, uh, 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 Nasser's uh, pan-Arabism. Um, it was never a dominant narrative and it never managed to uh, 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 um, go uh, or to uh, win over the overwhelm the, the, the state narrative. Um, so uh, I already mentioned it. Um, within, and maybe this is polemical, but within this, uh, narrative, this counter-hegemonic narrative of the Islamic Ummah, there is, there is a sub-narrative, that of pan-Arabism. Uh, I, I consider it a sub-narrative because it is very limited in time. Uh, it, it was established basically in the mid-40s. Uh, 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 it was very, a very dominant uh, narrative in the 50s and in the 60s with the Nasser. It was reinforced uh, when the bad uh, party, the bad parties, won in who got to power both in Iraq and in Syria, who got even became even more uh, relevant uh, with Gaddafi in Libya. But this um, uh, uh, this narrative has just has eventually died out. And after the defeat of 1967, after um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Nasser left power and died, uh, there, there is no more resonance to the, 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 the pan-Arab uh, narrative. Although we still uh, hear it uh, from time to time uh, and it still resonates from time to time, but I think that, for instance, uh, uh, the, these uh, uh, Abrahamic accords between Israel and uh, several Arab states, in particular the UAE and Morocco, have just buried the, any uh, expectation of having uh, an, uh, uh, a pan-Arab project, at least for the time being. Um, so in this counter-hegemonic narrative, uh, or narratives uh, being the Ummah and the Qawmiyah, two, two variants around the same narrative. The origin of the threat was the West in general and Israel in particular. Um, some radical Islamists from Sayyid Qutb to some violent uh, uh, extremists today consider that the regimes are also, uh, uh, the regimes in place are also a source of threat. Um, uh, and part of their argument is that these regimes uh, pay just lip service to the Palestinian cause. And uh, um, so they should be, uh, they, they, we should get rid of the regimes in order to be able to establish an, uh, 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 an Ummah. So they are the enemies. So we have the West Israel, represented by Israel in the, the region and the, the regimes eventually as a, a source of threat uh, to the insecurity according to this uh, other narrative. Um, uh, so I want to add here a, a degree of uh, complexity. So in these two narratives, the state-centered narrative, the uh, uh, counter-hegemonic narrative of uh, pan-Islamists and pan-Arab uh, with the variant, the, the, the Arab, pan-Arab variant, um, 
we always, uh, there is a homogenizing uh, narrative of identity. We're Moroccans, we're Muslims, we're Arabs. And when we do this, there is uh, uh, other uh, possibilities, other narratives are uh, either ignored, silenced, or spoken on behalf of. So, and when we do that, we increase the insecurity of those who are ignored, silenced, or spoken on behalf of. And I refer here to migrants, to minorities, and to women. So uh, this is, I need to rush. So migrants, for instance, are not acknowledged. Their insecurities are ignored and not heard. The discourse of the security of the states um, uh, the securitizes them and makes them the source of threat, which increases their vulnerability and their insecurity. Uh, they are not part of the national political realm. So, uh, and here uh, I am open to suggestions and to discussions. So, what case studies uh, should be should allow would allow me to make the case better? The Sub-Saharan Africans uh, in Morocco, Syrians in Lebanon, Palestinians in Jordan. Um, um, I still have not made uh, up my mind about this or any decision. Minorities are silenced. Um, Amazir, the Druze, the Kurds, uh, I'm more familiar here with uh, the, 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 the Christian minorities, Shia minorities. So I'm more familiar here with the Amazir uh, uh, in, in North Africa. Um, uh, the, and there is the, the very significant case uh, in the Algerian civil war of the 1990s, when the Kabyles were uh, targeted by the regime as well as by the Islamists and paid the price of uh, their, uh, and had their insecurities heightened uh, during those years, uh, late years of the 1990s in Algeria. Um, and women and gender are also spoken on behalf of. Uh, uh, my idea is to talk about the, 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 the rewriting of the Moroccan Mudawana, but I'm also open to discussion here uh, and to suggestions. Um, uh, women are homogenized and expected to be part of this collective identity. They are part of the state, they are part of the ummah. And, uh, and gender is not even discussed in most of the cases. Uh, just a, sm a small parenthesis, a recent article uh, um, in Moroccan media of a Moroccan lesbian who about dreaming of being married to her partner in Morocco in, uh, in the Moroccan press has still a, a very interesting debate, uh, but a marginalized debate. So to go back to my two assumptions, knowledge is socially constructed and that the word out there is also socially constructed. And if we want to change status quo and produce knowledge that can help people emancipate, in other words, if we are to study international security from the point of view of the marginalized, this is what I say, we need to start with the insecurities of individuals and communities, and we have to link those insecurities to the constitution of, a polit of political communities that should be inclusive uh, of diverse and identities. And I stop here, this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nizar. Um, I have uh, some comments here, but as I get these going, um, uh, as uh, Vish has reminded us, if you want, if you have questions, if you want to join in the discussion here, please uh, put those in the Q and A. There you can see that button down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, I assume. Um, yeah, Nizar. So yeah, really fascinating. Um, to hear how you're plotting this, situating this um, within the field of IR. And I think um, just to kind of, one, one question that I have, and I think this is relevant in the sense of the different positions that the audience are in, most of whom not I are, but some some are, but um, the, the, the direction that you're advocating taking from these marginalized populations and putting them into the mix in terms of IR, um, which is the starting point uh, for a lot of other disciplines, right? Their, their orientation would be flipped. Um, and so I'm, I'm just wondering how you see that in the sense of, I guess the, the, through the talk, what I, the, the piece kind of for me from the outside as a non-IR person is the whole notion of security and having more, if you could help us maybe as an audience, I, I feel this way, 
a sense of like does does the entire do all is the all of the assumptions that are built into this idea of security are they redeemable at all in the sense like is the concept itself fundamentally flawed because i think it, it does have such a top down orientation in the sense of security for whom um and so i guess that's part of it's like how you would plot um what what is this uh, in a sense, like what defining, how are you redefining what security is, is, is one, one of my questions. Um, and then secondly, I think it's, how do you think this relates, the non-IR work, um, how that would relate into the IR discussions, and then the reverse, which is, what does IR bring to the outside? Um, is this just the one direction? Because I see a lot of ways in which you could bring work that's coming from anthropology, from history, from sociology, from geography that's critical, that, that has, has kind of laid out that groundwork that you'd be incorporating into IR. So I think that's maybe more clear to me. What, what is IR, how, what would it say? Is, it, is, that, is that the whole angle of the, of the, the intervention? Um, or do you think there's something that pushes out that IR helps us think about something differently, maybe through this lens of security? Hopefully that's clear. Um, it is, thank you for that question. Uh, it is one of the issues that uh, has uh, haunted us in, in, in the field of, uh, in IR. Um, what do we bring to the debate? Uh, uh, someone said that we are uh, 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 an importer of concepts, uh, but there are very few concepts that we have exported to other, uh, to other fields. I think that the discussion on security is, uh, uh, is something very uh, uh, proper to the field of international relations. I didn't want to, to spend too much time on that here because I suspected that the, the audience wouldn't be that uh, 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 from the field uh, essentially. So I didn't want to to uh, spend too much time on this, but there has been a long debate in, in the field of, inter uh, of international security about reforming the field of security. So um, since the 1980s, uh, there are many different schools that have brought the concept of uh, critical security studies uh, that, uh, and, uh, that have uh, established the concept of insecurity instead of the concept of security. So it started with gender studies uh, in the field of international relations and in the field of security, uh, gender uh, and uh, uh, many scholars from gender who focused on insecurities instead of security and um, to others in the field of uh, security who for instance, brought the concept of securitization. How can, does a topic become, uh, uh, an issue become a, a security topic? Uh, what is needed to make a topic a security topic? So this is, uh, um, so, uh, uh, and the, the concept, uh, securitization theory has been a dominating way of looking at security over the last uh, 20 plus years, because it allowed to, it allowed many scholars to, uh, to uh, see how migration, for instance, uh, ceases to be a, a social issue or an economic issue, and it becomes a security issue. Uh, how the environment is uh, environment uh, environmental studies at one moment, but at a certain moment it becomes a security issue. How energy supplies are logistics, economics, whatever, but what at what uh, uh, at a certain moment it becomes a security issue. So securitization theory has helped us. Uh, bring uh, 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 complexity to the complex of security and not leave it only to uh, the, the domination of uh, those who study military uh, uh, military issues, but 
uh, it has also been criticized uh, in the sense that it remains also uh, uh, very non-political. So um, uh, the importance of making security as part of politics, as part of the political process and not as some uh, uh, isolated realm in which uh, specific rules apply that do not apply to the political to the, 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 the political realm. So there are debates in the field of security that uh, 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 I am engaged in in what I'm writing and that uh, bring this complexity to, uh, to to the concept. So but I just didn't want to overwhelm the audience with that discussion. So to the second part of your question, so what does the field of uh, of IR bring to um, to uh, to social sciences? I think that the field brings this uh, international perspective, uh, and it's what I throughout my presentation I constantly refer to. What happens in North Africa and the Middle East is not particular to North Africa and the Middle East. We can see instances uh, of it happening in South America, in South Asia, in Asia, in other parts of the world, or even in, in, in Europe. So the, the, what the field of, in, of international relations brings to us is this global perspective. There are debates about how, whether uh, the, the, the name of international relations is a proper name for the field. And uh, so scholars are talking about global affairs, uh, global studies, uh, but the idea is that the field brings this global perspective and the, the, the facts that these are trends that do not happen in only in one place, that we can understand them by comparing them and analyzing them throughout different uh, uh, realities out there. So I think that this is one of the main contributions of the field of international relations. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna go to a question here uh, from Nurdin Amara, who's asking, and just on the basis of what you're talking about, social constructionism, you know, that, uh, knowledge and power are involved in narratives um and if kind of if the international is a struggle among these different power players and mainly between states then how do we judge what is fair what is not fair within that so i guess that's kind of a normative dimension of why yeah from what basis do you make that kind of a, a critical intervention or, or make those kind of judgments um this is Thank you, Nordin, for that question. Uh, this is a this has been a, a, a topic of discussion not only in international relations uh, uh, for a, a long period of time. Who who are we to make uh, uh, some value judgments, and uh, on what basis are we going to to do that? I think that one of the answers that has been brought uh, by the Frankfurt School is the rationality and the use of rationality, the use of, of reason in order to distinguish what is uh, what what is acceptable from what is not acceptable. So, um, and uh, so, and there is a consensus that is established uh, towards accepting that this is acceptable, this is, uh, and that is uh, not acceptable. But in these, in these narratives, uh, both these narratives, the, 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 the state narrative and the counter hegemonic narrative of uh, 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 those uh, of pan-Islamism or pan-Arabism, as, as I was, um, maybe I didn't mention it in my presentation, the, the concept of uh, Westphalia, the peace of Westphalia and the establishment of the nation state was not established immediately. 16, we have the date of 1648 as the magic date of the establishment of accepting uh, of the signing of the peace of, uh, of the Treaty of Westphalia and the establishment of the nation state. But as many scholars have shown, uh, 
the, there was a huge resistance to the concept of the nation state uh, up until the moment in which it became the, the rule of the game and um, now the field of international relations speaks about these uh, relations among states and the United Nations is uh, an, organiza an organization of uh, nation uh, of a sovereign state and so on and so forth. So in the, the region, I think that there, by the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, uh, with the imminent, it, what was seen as a, a imminent uh, uh, end of the Ottoman Empire, uh, th there were questions, and there, there, there was also the Western threat, th there were questions being asked, and uh, what is going to replace this, and uh, should we, and there was a narrative among some, some uh, political leaders of establishing this uh, state, these independent states, whereas others were uh, aiming at uh, replacing the Ottoman Empire with uh, another uh, pan-Muslim uh, uh, entity. Um, the sovereign, those who defended the idea of the sovereign state took advantage of the opportunities presented by the world uh, um, and the, the reality out there and established the, the, so, the sovereign states. But those sovereign states were not, uh, but they, this sovereign state was contested, has been constantly con contested by all these counter hegemonic narratives uh, uh, since its establishment. So it's the same process somehow that existed in after 1648 that has been existing since the, 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 the second decade of the 20th century in the Arab region. Some sovereign states were established and there, were, there has been a contestation of the, the, the validity of those uh, sovereign states as the only political communities that are possible and the establishment of alternative political communities uh, in the form of uh, pan-Islam or pan-Arabism for a few decades, but uh, some different uh, political uh, communi communities alternative to the, the sovereign state. So the state was not there. Um, so. And we are still in that contestation, although today uh, the states are there and powerful and they have created roots and they have established themselves as the, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, as the, 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 <coughs> the main actors. Uh, there is co constant contestation of the role of the sovereign state uh, by these alternative narratives. Um, I had a follow, and this relates to Marsha has a comment, and anything that's related to the flow of what you're talking about. There is this sense of uh, within your presentation and your within the project that you're setting out of uh, different these, you know, what would be classified as subaltern uh, groups and in, in, in these different marginalized communities from below that really that, that would problematize the existing kind of scope of that. Um, I, from that, I one of the questions I had. Uh, overall about what you're trying to do in your uh, how you would in, in your broader perspective is is there anything this is a constant thing the united the, the middle east is uh i you know unexceptional you you made that argument is like okay you have this in the middle east you also have it here you also have it here um but I, so i'm wondering uh are there ways in which the middle east does have an exceptional dimension in the ways that you're rethinking international security that that you would put forward is like there's these are some specific dynamics that are happening here that I'm working with that are rel that kind of I, I would put out into that broader discussion of ways that um, broader um, security uh, international security is, is theorized or, or conceptualized. Uh, I think that it's the, the image of the map. Uh, 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 I. I resorted to. It is the perspective, uh, how you look at uh, the world from your own reality. Uh, so 
what exists in in North Africa is to a large extent specific to North Africa, but it is not only a, a, a North African phenomenon or a Middle Eastern phenomenon. So um, the fact that we have uh, Amazigh, uh, that we have uh, the, the gender issue uh, with a certain dynamic, uh, that we have uh, uh, migration from uh, sub-Saharan Africa, all of these things are specific to that region that do not exist in other regions. So in, in South America, the, the, maybe in Central America, the, the migration uh, dimension would exist, but in South America, the migration dimension would not exist. So that is a particular dimension to, to North Africa. Uh, in South America, the, the gender the dimension would be uh, put forward in very different terms, although it exists there, although it is an issue there, but it exists under a different dimension in, 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 in South America. Um, uh, the, uh, the ethnic minority, the, 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 so uh, minorities, uh, mi migrants, uh, gender, all of these constitute our exist and interact in a different in a specific way in, in in North Africa and the Middle East and those interactions would take place differently in uh, other parts of the African continent in South America or uh, or in Asia so we're distinguishing here between North Africa and, uh, and uh, uh, other parts of the, the African continent and there are different dimensions of the, 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 the of security among these parts. So that's why it is important to study the, the, the insecurity in uh, West Africa, the insecurity of North Africa, the insecurity of uh, East, uh, Eastern Africa or the Southern Corner in Africa, because it's those insecurities that should inform uh, the extent to which they they have their own categories and their own concepts and their own theories about security. That's what should inform the theories of security and insecurity in these different parts, uh, and not uh, impose the, the 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 lenses of Western Europe or North Africa on the study of insecurities in Western Africa, for instance. I don't know if I'm answering the question here. No, I like, yeah, and I'm just, we're going to sneak in. We have just enough time. Iman Nuwahid's asking about the Arab uprisings, and I think that um, maybe in, in that same direction. So how, what, could you maybe put it through in your model or your, your framework of how you're dealing with this? How do you, yeah, what's your take on the Arab uprisings um, in terms of those directions? So uh, how do you it? Oh, um, Okay, I see. This is this is really an, uh, uh, one of the questions I'm uh, struggling with. Uh, not struggling. I'm uh, considering for uh, for this project uh, the role played by uh, the Arab uprisings. Because uh, what we saw with the Arab uprisings was uh, uh, in Egypt, in 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 Tunisia even in a, pla a place where the Arab uprisings were very mild like Morocco, we saw a different uh, iteration of, the, of identity. We saw a, 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 an identity that was, uh, even if th 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 there was a, a, a presence of the Islamists in the street, the, uh, uh, it was a, a secular message. It was a more inclusive message uh, with the presence of women in the streets, uh, with the presence of, uh, 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 so with the Arab uprisings, we saw this from the bottom up, uh, an articulation of an identity that was different from, that is different from the, the, the hegemonic discourse and the counter hegemonic discourse. And, uh, so that was something very uh, interesting to observe, and I think that it brings something to the to the debate here. That 
I, I, I need to deal with. I don't know how to deal with it, but I think that it brings answer to, uh, I think that it can bring answers to how uh, security can be uh, the, 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 the the double narrative security slash insecurity can be dealt with in the region from the region and to study uh, and to establish it uh, from uh, the perspective of the region. So I think that this is uh, the, 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 the Arab uprisings were moments that can bring some answers, some uh, concrete answers to the questions I am asking here. Uh, I asked here in, and I, the, Provided just uh, a glimpse to an answer in the last in the last um, slide. Awesome, um, we're at, at our time here. It's really great uh, to hear about this uh, project, uh, Nizar, and thank you all for uh, being part of the audience for your questions. And I'm going to point out um, that uh, in the in the chat there, you have uh, the link for the next CMES colloquium talks to be next Thursday by Allison Mickle of Lehigh University. Um, so check that out and we will see you next week, hopefully. Thank you very much. Thanks, David.